All right, so we are recording. Again, I am Dr. Kim Godwin. I am an instructional designer with MTSU Online. And uh, with us today, um, in addition to all of you participants that we're so glad that you're here, are um, Karen Hine and Tara Perrin, the other two instructional designers with MTSU Online. And uh, they are here to help answer questions. Um, Tara is monitoring the chat. And I think Karen is definitely gonna help with that too. Um, and then we are gonna do our best to teach you the basics, um, kind of an introduction and gamification and how to get started to engage our students in new and different processes within uh, how we keep them actively learning in our classes and do it in kind of a fun way. Um, so as a reminder before we really get going on this too, um, as always, there are lots and lots and lots of presentations available and presentations coming up uh, through the LT and ITC that we really encourage you to take a look at um, and try to be a part of the ones that you're interested in, in doing. Um, I know there's a couple more coming up as part of the OER grant that the university got from the state. So if y'all are interested in more about OER, you should definitely check out the rest of those um, because you haven't been in one of those yet, one of the things you may not know is that there are a little mini grants that are coming out of that grant for faculty. Um, so that's y'all. Um, so you may be interested in how you can incorporate some more um, open educational resources in your class. And then there's tons of other ones because they do such a great job over there on the LTITC of getting all kinds of different types of presentations together. So I really encourage y'all to check that out. Um, okay, so Typically, I will give you a cute little PowerPoint that's like the slide of MTSU online. Um, I am not actually using a PowerPoint today. Uh, a couple of reasons. One, I don't know if y'all know this about me, but I'm not the most pro PowerPoint person on the planet. Um, so I try to avoid them if at all possible. Uh, but also because we've actually built a module in the um, MTSU online certification self-registration course. Um, so if you are not registered for that class, that MTSU online certification class through self-registration in D2L, I strongly encourage you to register for that at some point. When you go to the main D2L homepage, it's up at the top in that top nav bar where it's like email home, self-registration is one of them. You go in through there and you'll select the one that is the online certification. And then within that, once you're in it, you will actually see a module that is LTN ITC presentations. And one of the ones in there is this gamification one. And part of the reason that it's built in there is so that you can see how some of these things actually work in D2L. Um, and then also so that you will have access to it later. Uh, so you can go in and review it whenever you want and kind of really get in there and look and see what some of that information looks like. Um, and then, of course, you'll have contact information with us and additional resources. So um, I am actually going to share my screen and then I'm going to take you through that class, uh, that presentation a little bit as a student, because I want you to see it from the student's perspective. And then I'm going to talk to you a little bit about how to do some of those basic things in um, gamification. So, um, sorry. Oh, Tara, I'm sure you've got that. I see it pop up, but I'm sure you've got it. <laughs> um, okay, so um, again, that's on the, the MTSU online certification is in the self-registration on D2L. And here we go. I'm going to share my screen. All right, so here we have the MTSU online certification course. Um, it is uh, those of you that have taken the instructor certification for when you're teaching somebody else's online class, that's in here, but there are a lot of other presentations and workshops and information and resources that are also available in here. It is not just that instructor certification. Um, this is where we put a whole lot of things. So um, if you're, if you get a chance, get in there because there really is some cool stuff. So um, when you're on this page, I'm just going to take you to where you need to go first. So we'll go into content. Don't pay attention over here to the updates, by the way, that it's not really that there's 502 that no one has looked at. It's that I might not have as this status looked at them. 
Um, so when you're looking at, at this course and you're kind of scrolling down, um, it's already on it because it's the last place I was, but it's down here on the left hand side. It's kind of near the bottom and it is the LTN, ITC and departmental presentations. And then for gamification presentation is the one that we're using today. Uh, so I'm going to take you through this a little bit as a student would go through it. We're going to talk just a little bit about um, some of the uh, learning theory and the design models and things that are, are behind gamification and why it is helpful and um, how you can use that with your students to really increase learning and engagement. So um, to start off though, um, y'all know I like to talk about my learning objectives and how to align those. So at the conclusion of this presentation, um, you should be able to describe the basic concepts of gamification, construct badges and awards. So sneaky little, I'm gonna tell you about that in a minute. I'm actually gonna walk y'all through how to do that. And there are, some awards that I have made public in our D2L instance. So everyone at MTSU, um, every faculty member at MTSU has access to those awards. So I'm gonna show you how you can put those in your class. Um, illustrate active learning techniques, locate digital Easter eggs, and demonstrate a digital scavenger hunt. Uh, so those are the things that I'm gonna talk about today. So before we go too far, um, the next little statement in there um, tells you that there is a digital Easter egg in this area. Um, does anybody have any idea how we might go looking for one of those? And I can make it a little bit bigger. Well, since I don't even know what a digital Easter egg is, I guess that would be the first place I would start. Right? So digital Easter eggs, actually the virtual Easter eggs and digital Easter eggs, uh, they actually go back to an Atari game. I told y'all we referenced <laughs> back in the old school. Um, they go back to an Atari game where things were hidden by the developers within the game. And when you found them, you received special awards or you got, you know, you got a special tool that would help you accomplish the next mission or you found a special path because of that specific um, Easter egg that you found. So within this one, as a student, uh, in order for me to find a digital Easter egg, one of the ways that they are hidden in a class is that you actually just change the font color so that it is not visible. And if you watch my cursor, and you, because I, I know where it is, I'm gonna aim it for the right spot. But if you watch my cursor, you will actually see when it appears because it changes from the arrow cursor to the little finger pointy cursor <laughs> so that we can then click that and it takes so it's a, just a hidden link it's all it is is a hidden link so oh, and it will take us and this is just a resource that's out there with some super cool information about gamification um so that is all a virtual Easter egg is, it is hidden. It is not freely available without you actually kind of looking for it just a little bit. Um, so it's not just listed. Here's one more thing. Um, when you tell the students, oops, it popped up to the wrong one, that's my bad. Um, when you tell the students that they're in there, it actually kind of gives them an opportunity to just start looking a little bit further into your course um, and start kind of seeing if there's other things in there. So the reason for that is that it actually creates an opportunity for them to actively engage in their learning experience. Um, so instead of the information just here's this, here's this, here's this, if you say there's some additional resources in here if you are interested in them, um, or tying them back in to uh, what you're doing or how you're doing things in the class. And it really just kind of creates kind of a fun way to look for stuff. Um, it's usually how I hide things in my classes that are, they're just cool additional resources. Um, they're not necessarily something that I am looking to have them specifically watch or read this thing um, because of you know what I'm doing with my activities and my alignment, but it's really kind of thing and I wouldn't mind them knowing about it or if they want more information it's a great place to kind of start them down that wormhole of learning more about what these things are and it it's a quick and easy way just to do some fun stuff do you think um, they all will know how to search for easter eggs and what they are and that they're looking for a hidden cursor flip 
because I also had no idea. I've never played Atari <laughs> in my life. You know, even though I'm the right age to have done it, that's just not. It's you know. okay. Um, the answer is every kid, every student knows about Easter eggs. I do believe. Yeah, I'd say mid thirties and younger would. Yeah, yeah, they're a lot more common um, now. Actually, they go back to Atari, but um, a lot of websites have them, and most games that people play, um, you know, your Xbox, your PlayStation. Um, most of those and even ones that people play like on their phone or whatever um a lot of those have those hidden um little gifts that are places and and they are becoming known as virtual easter eggs or digital easter eggs um but that also in itself uh the first time that you do it in a class it it wouldn't be horrible if um you i always tell students there's easter eggs in my classes when they're in them so that they know to actually go looking for them. Um, and if it is a class that I'm just not sure if they're gonna know what that is based on whether or not they're likely to have had me before, um, I will usually put a hyperlink where the first time is that I talk about virtual Easter eggs and send them like to just a random okay. Wikipedia site that tells you what that is so that they know what they're looking for. Um, I don't tend to tell them how to find them because to me that takes away um, from the search that they would be having to do. Um, so there's that one. So this one, um, it, it's, pro it's not going to give it to me. Eh, it'll probably give it to me when I log back in as when I turn myself off of student. So I attached it to a badge and it will actually award me a badge because we clicked on that link. So I'm about to get a badge. Uh, so, um, moving into the class just a little bit now that we've actually already covered one whole topic. Um, I have shared for y'all in this um, a presentation that I actually did for an instructional design certification program that I went to, uh, went through quite a while ago, um, but this is actually our course presentation. And the reason that I want to show this to you is it's actually a really, I mean, I'm going to brag on myself a little bit, but it's actually really a great resource for um, the theories, the learning theories and stuff behind gamification. And then it also has some cool resources you might want to go play with later. So we'll just go ahead and take a look at that one. Um, so this again was my class presentation and um, these are my, my teammates here. Um, and up here in the top right corner, um, we talk about, and if you can't see it, feel free to move us around. Um, we talk about what it is and then we take a look at some of the theory. Um, and I'm, we have a lot to cover today, so I'm not going to stay on theory for too long, but y'all know I love theory, so you know I'm going to talk about it a little bit. Um, so uh, one of them is constructivist theory. So uh, in some of our other presentations, we've talked about uh, constructivist theory and the concepts behind that, but it really is the whole, it builds on itself. Um, and we take this and it goes to the next. Well, in the truest form of gamification, when you accomplish this goal, you go to the very next project or goal or path. Um, so in itself, it is actually constructing an entire activity just through the whole concept of how games are played. Because um, any game we play, that's how we do it. Even if it's something as, um, as basic as like shoots and ladders, you actually are constructing as you go through that because you're building yourself up to the next path to the next level. And you know, you're learning that if you land on a slide, you're gonna slide all the way back. And if you land on a ladder, you're gonna move forward. So you're learning those processes as you go. And that is actually gamification and constructivist theory. I told y'all. <laughs> Oh, they're fun. Um, I, don't, the I don't remember that Easter egg. Do what? I don't remember that audio Easter egg. I know. <laughs> <laughs> right? So they're great Danes. So they're really big. So they make a lot of noise when they do that. <laughs> so um, the next one that I really wanted to hit on is actually motivation theory. And then specifically the ARCS model. Um, and the ARCS model to me uh, really fits so well and is kind of an easier one for me to, to remember and think about when I'm doing these because it really is the four basic steps. Um, you grab their attention, it has relevance, it creates confidence, and then they get some sort of satisfaction. So you do something that gets them to want to be there. The activity itself has relevance to their learning or their life 
um, or any of those things. It helps them build confidence because they have done something well and moved on to the next level. And then satisfaction comes from if you get an award or like a badge or award in the class or just the satisfaction of knowing that you did it well, but really thinking about um, am, why am I doing the things that I'm doing in my course? Like, you know, we're not gonna give a badge just for showing up um, unless somebody actually showed up every single time. And then we actually do tend to give them um, some sort of participation points in our classes or a, a bonus point for attendance or something like that, because we really do actually want them to see that we are excited that they did these things uh, and that they accomplished these things. And no matter who we are, we like to be acknowledged for things that we do well. Um, it, we like getting that gold star on our paper. We like scratch and sniff stickers. Um, it's really hard to do scratch and sniff stickers in a, a digital environment. So creating badges that release or giving them a bonus point or opening information that's new ways for them to engage and learn that actually in itself creates that level of satisfaction. When they find that Easter egg, they get a badge, but they also found this thing that they had to go and actively look for and it took them out into the world to learn more about a topic or to learn more about some information. So we're actually creating new levels of learning and knowing through our reward process. And, you know, once you get one sticker, you kind of look and see if you can get another sticker because we like stickers. Um, so those are really the, the two biggest theories that I wanted to hit on. I do encourage uh, when you go into this class, kind of taking a look at the gainful learning um, experience. This one is really cool and it goes further into the processes um, of gamification is pretty involved so um, it takes me a little while to explain that one so um, maybe at some point we'll be able to talk about that one a little bit more um, but I know I know y'all want to get on to the other things um, and then of course the community of inquiry um, this hits just about everything that we do in um, in online learning uh, and in learning in general um, is about creating community and creating opportunities for engagement for our students to connect with us, with our content and with each other. Uh, and in, when you have activities that are gamification based, they're very definitely having to engage with the information in the class and the resources in the class because they cannot move forward if they're not actively engaging with what those resources and information are. Uh, and then the other page I kind of wanted to show you on this presentation from my certification, this is, y'all ask about games earlier. So this is your go-to gift for games. Okay, also that is an old video that is from early in the pandemic. That's when I was still in my kitchen. Um, but right down here, um, gamification through the decades. We've got the 70s. Did anybody play Oregon Trail? Cause I did, um, right? Did anybody not die on Oregon Trail? Um, and then uh, some Carmen San Diego. Oh yeah, Carmen San Diego. Um, number munchers. Yeah. Oh my gosh, number munchers best. Um, food force. Uh, that that was one that came a little bit. Let's say right. This is when you. I was actually in graduate school and jobs by this point. Um, so I was not as involved in some of these. Um, a few years ago, though, Minecraft uh, was one that people really used. Minecraft a lot in gamifications and online courses um, and it works with some but not so well with others um, i never really got on the minecraft train I mean, it wasn't mine but a lot of people really love it and then i also added um lexia learning um, and that is actually really current um and that is one i i learned that because of my seven-year-old nephew uh when he does activities in his lexia learning he actually gets credits that he gets to play games after he's done his activities. So it is gamification right there in that program. Um, so I wanted to make sure that y'all knew these existed so that y'all know where to go to play some Carmen San Diego because everybody loves Carmen San Diego. Okay, so now we're just gonna go back to the class um, and I'm gonna take you through this class as a student because we kind of talked about our learning theories a little bit. 
Um, so a scavenger hunt, there's a couple different ways to do scavenger hunts within gamification. One is literally looking around in the course for Easter eggs. That in itself is a scavenger hunt or looking around in the course for resources. Um, have a pattern with that. It shouldn't just be like all willy nilly, like actually have a structure with why you have them going in certain directions. But there's also the scavenger hunt where they go out and they seek and find information and then they bring it back into the class. Uh, if you have had many really or any conversations with any of your IDs and MTSU online, um, we frequently talk about in discussions that um, this is such a great way to get students engaged with the material and engage with each other to go out and look for a resource uh, and then them put that resource in the class. And the response that would be required from your classmates is that you actually go and look at the person's person's thing that they put in there, the thing they found, and then you comment on the thing that they found. So a couple of great things that come from that. One, the students are having to actively go out and seek resources that connect with the materials that you're discussing in the class. Um, two, your students that are responding are getting more information because they're getting to see what other people found. So it's more than what you would have just found on your own. It's not quite as overwhelming as if you try to put all of those resources in your class and hit cognitive overload for your students because they're looking for their own thing and they're picking the thing that connected with them and why it connected with them. And then the students are engaging with each other in terms of why that activity was chosen or why that link was chosen and how that connects with each of them as a learner. So in that one discussion, you hit all three components of your community of inquiry and you've hit um, on some constructivist theory and you've hit on some ARCS model because people, if you put something of yourself, something that you connected with, something that talks about you in a discussion, and your classmates talk to you about how they enjoyed what you did or how the thing that they commented on made them think about something. We feel that as students and as learners. And so we feel more connected to that activity because we have a personal stake in that activity. Uh, and our classmates are talking about us and how what we did had an impact on them. And so we really just start seeing some of that they tend to connect with each other from that point forward. They really have a really great body of um, looking at diversity and perspective and inclusion and all those things happen when each of our students goes out and finds their own, their own thing that they wanna put in there. Uh, so for this one, it was uh, just a discussion that the student literally would kind of talk about this video, watch the video a little bit, um, and then go and do their own scavenger hunt based on something that they found about gamification and they would enter it into the discussion. Uh, and just like every other discussion, when you click on the discussion as a student, it pops up, it gives you the information, you start a new thread and then it goes in there. Clearly a couple people have already been here, um, but you go ahead and you start a new thread and um, you put your resource in there. So Amy put in a Flipgrid resource um, and Karen put in a resource um, from Michigan. I'm an Ohio State fan, so that's hard to say. Um, Winter Games. Um, and so really just kind of picking the thing that connected with you on the internet, that's what makes a difference for the students. So they would go in and they would post um, in that discussion and then go back and communicate on what other people shared and the information that was in there. Okay, so to open up the next section of the course, um, there's a quiz here. So we're going to take this quiz and I'm going to show you what happens because as you, oops, as you see, there's a quiz here and then it goes immediately to additional resources for faculty. Um, so we're going to take this quiz really fast and we'll hope that I pass it um, since I wrote it. Um, we'll see. Um, um, so there we go. It's not a hard quiz, so we'll hope that I can do this one okay. Uh, we are located in Murfreesboro. Oh, look, I just mentioned Ohio State and there's Brutus. Uh, we are lightning and our colors are blue and white. And then I submit my quiz. So 
I have submitted my quiz um, and this is now in there. So I'm going to take you back to that gamification presentation page and I want to show you, assuming all things worked correctly, <laughs> hey, they did. Um, so that is a release condition. So one of the things about gamification is that the release conditions that are available in D2L are fantastic for gamification because in order for a resource or an activity or something to open, they have to have completed the previous task. So in a game, you have to do this before you get to this, or you have to do this before you get to this. When you played Mario Brothers, you didn't start off on level eight dungeon saving the princess. You had to go through all of those worlds before you got there. So it's about setting it up so that everything isn't necessarily right there. They're completing this task, which leads to this task, which leads to this task. Um, if you were in our presentation a couple weeks ago about checklists, checklists also work really well with gamification. So, um, and it's the same general concept of having a checklist uh, in terms of, gen of gamification and how you go from step to step to step. Um, so in this one, in order to complete the next level of activities, um, we either have to play Oregon Trail or we have to play Number Munchers. Um, does anybody have a preference? As to, all right, we're just going to do Oregon Trail really quick just so you can see it. Definitely Oregon Trail. I mean, right? Uh, see, look, it's that old school Oregon Trail. So when you go to play um, the Oregon Trail, it's taken in a minute. Anyway, when it's not being quite so slow. Um, Oregon Trail actually pops up right here. I mean, the ox and the wagon and everything. Um, and you would actually select, you go through and you make your choices. Uh, you actually get to shoot buffalo with your space bar like you did back in the back in the day. Um, like it is, it is legit, that game. Uh, so you would actually go through and you would play this activity. Now in a class, I didn't put all the instructions in this because I knew it would take too long. In a class, you would actually talk about the specifics of what you want them to do. So where mine just had a link to Oregon Trail, if this was a course, I would have actually said, you need to play this game twice as two different professions um, starting at different months. Uh, and then because we would use that information later in an assessment activity. Um, or the same with number munchers. You need to play at this level and at this level, and then we'll talk about the differences. Um, so we would, we're pretending that we've played and we made it to Oregon. Um, so um, sorry. So when we get back here, what I want to show you is what just happened because I clicked on the Oregon Trail game. It gave me that everything you thought you learned playing Oregon Trail is wrong resource. Um, and so it's actually pretty interesting. I'll check it out sometime. Um, so it actually gave me that resource. And so I would then go in and take a look at this resource um, and see what this resource is gonna tell me about. So I've played my game. Here is the additional academic resource. Okay, maybe not academic, but in your world, it would be more academic than, than this resource. Uh, my D2L is slow today. Um, can we just pretend that it opened since my D2L is being so slow? Okay, good, great, thanks. Um, so we pretend that we looked at that activity. Hopefully it actually acknowledged it. It did. And so because we read that article um, and we spent that time on that article, we now are going to go do our reflection. So here's the part about this reflection that even really adds to that gamification. What it talks about in my reflection is that you were supposed to talk about the one that you did because you only had to pick one. You either played Oregon Trail or Number Munchers. Um, so if you did Oregon Trail, you come in here and you talk about your experience with Oregon Trail. And then the other group talks about their experience with Number Munchers, but your response posts have to be to someone who played a different game than you. Now, do you know what happens when that occurs, the students actually end up going and playing the other game too, um, because they become curious about it and they become interested in it. And they actually want to know more because their classmates and friends are talking about what they got from the activity and they're talking about what they learned and we can't help, but as inquisitive people want to go see what it is that they're talking about. 
Um, so what happens in situations like this is that we are actually creating opportunities for students to make choices about their own learning and the path that they're taking on their learning, but also to what level of engagement that they're doing, because you will have some that go in and click Oregon Trail and the article and then do their discussion and that's the end of it. You have some that will go in and click Oregon Trail, play it, watch that, post their discussion, then see their classmates talking about number munchers, go back, play number munchers, read that article and end up kind of being sucked into that concept. So not only are they continuing to engage and, and learn in those activities, but you're actually taking them to that next level of lifelong learning and creating an appreciation for continued depth and engagement in learning materials and activities. Um, and you did it in a way that might have been a little more fun than some of the other ones that we do sometimes. I'm first to tell you that not every activity I've ever had is super awesome. Um, and not everyone gets 100% yeehaw from my students. So um, I know that some are probably more engaging than others. And sometimes that's definitely the case because of what we need or what we're talking about in terms of our course at that time. Um, but something like this really does create that opportunity to learn from each other, to create that active learning environment and to really contribute to the creation of lifelong learning and excitement about learning. Um, and I suspect that y'all are excited when your students get excited about learning. I know I am. Um, so when they get excited, I even get more excited and then I want to be more engaged and I know they want to be more engaged. Um, so that is pretty much in a nutshell, gamification, the brief version of how that works and some basics of it. Um, so I mentioned earlier that there was one other Easter egg. Does anybody have any guess where that one might be? I mean, it. <laughs> so if you move my little mouse around, when you get to the Boppet picture, uh, the Boppet picture actually lights up and it tells you that it will take you to a website. Uh, so I picked Boppet uh, and Boppet is because, I mean, I love Boppet. Um, it was way fun for me, um, but I also picked it because, uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, sometimes these opportunities of students going out and doing a scavenger hunt or bringing things in that are their own, it gives us that opportunity. Your mic went out, Kim. There we go. Is it back? I didn't even touch it. What? I told y'all I'm having a Wednesday. Um, so it is, um, it, the reason I like Bop It so much, uh, not just because of the game, but the reason I like it as a representation is because it talks about how uh, in order for it to work effectively, we need all those different perspectives and all those different experiences in order to successfully complete the game. So I'd use that one kind of as one of my representations when I'm talking about gamification, because there's no one way to get there when you're doing gamification. Uh, you can get there any way that you want. There's a million different things out there. And it is a huge, huge concept. I mean, I can talk about this for weeks. Um, we could set up an entire class that was a choose your own adventure class. Um, and it's going to take us a while to do that. So please know that uh, that's not happening tomorrow. Um, but, you know, there's so many different ways that you can get there. There's so many different ways that you can create learning and create those activities. But they're all still part of the same class. And they're all still part of the same great concept of learning. It's just how we got there. Um, and knowing that those perspectives really continue to add to the overall information that the students are gaining. Um, so I'm going to show you all how to do some of these things really quick. I'm going to take myself out as a student, show you all how to do these, and then um, give you a couple minutes to ask questions as well. Um, so. I did want to point out though that these are some additional resources that are in here so that when y'all go into the D2L um, course and you take a look at it and you start clicking around on things, there are some additional things in here that might be interesting to you. So here's a little thing that we talked about with Easter eggs at the beginning. Here's actually a resource for you about Easter eggs. Um, here's a little bit more information um, about game-based learning and gameful learning, gamification. It really is a more of what is the topic as a whole and talking about it. Um, that's all these are. So this one is one that um, that Karen stuck in there for us. Thank you, Karen. Um, so there is a way that you can do Jeopardy with PowerPoint and Google Slides. Um, it's really kind of cool, but 
we're not going to go too far into it today um, for a couple reasons. One, we don't have that kind of time. Uh, but two, uh, and maybe that's something we talk about down the road, but two, it takes a bit to make sure that those are accessible. Um, so they're there. There's a, there's a little template for you. But before you just drop that into your class, make sure that you are actually working to make sure it's accessible um, so that if there is somebody in your course that needs that accommodation, you have that from the beginning. It is so much easier to make something accessible as you're building it than it is to go back and try to fix it later. So I just wanted to kind of let you know that's there in case you want it and you want to use it in your class. Um, but know that you got to work to make it accessible. All right, so I'm going to make myself, oh, look at that. That should be it. Hey, I've gotten a couple of things here. I did something in the class, so I won something. Oh, look, I completed something. I got 100 on a quiz. Yay, me. <laughs> OK, so I'm going to turn me back to me. Um, and all of my personalities in D2L. Somebody should do a study of that sometime. Um, OK, so here is the gamification course from the uh, instructor perspective. So a lot of it is just going to look exactly the same. But what I wanted to kind of walk you through some of these very specific things as we go. So within your description box at the top of, of the module of any module of any sub module um, on any content that you place in the class, anytime there is a description box like this, you can put in that um, right there. So you can put in a link that's an Easter egg that you turn the font white and then embed it and hide it. Um, so you can do that anywhere. It is up to you whether or not you link your Easter eggs to a badge. I would say do that once at some point in the class, um, but don't don't try to do a different Easter egg with every single, don't try to do a badge with every single one. Just do like one, like congratulations, you found one. See if you can find the others. Um, so. <laughs> You get, how did you get that link? Where, what did you click to have it pop up? Sure. So hang on a second. So when you are looking at any um, content page and here, let me, I'm just going to take this out so that y'all can see what it looks like without the words in it. Okay. That is what your module looks like if you have not used your description box. So when you are on any module, in D2L um, or sub module where it has the title up at the top and then it says add dates and the restrictions and then it says add a description. That is that description box. So when you click there and you go in and, and you type in all of your information and it shows up, it's all right there. To add one of these little hidden Easter eggs, um, you can literally uh, you want to make sure that you expand it. That's what those three little dots are over there. And then it gives you additional uh, dialog box options. Check your font color. So my font color is black while I type it so that I can see it. Um, hey, I told y'all Wednesday. Mm -hmm. um, and then you literally highlight over it and then you click on the insert quick link which is up in that top box of activities. Um, the what do you want to insert pops up. Now, this is where if you want your Easter egg to actually link to a resource that's already in your class, or you want it to actually um, go to a discussion that you created, or you want it to directly go to something that is an extra Dropbox that you're going to give them extra credit for, or a chat, or you can link it to anything in the world you want. For this one, I'm just simply going to link it to the MTSU website. Um, we're going to use the library website because it's in my drop down. So there we go. So it now has the MTSU website and it is now linked in here. But to hide it, we simply highlight it, click on the font color box, check white. OK, that's what I was it. missing. I knew how to insert a link, but I didn't know how to hide it. It's just yeah. use white. Just use white. Okay. Uh, and then once you update it, we had the one that I already had in there, but now this one is down here. Okay. Um, and so we literally just added another Easter egg to our class. Um, 
So yay. Um, and yeah, then, share if that's okay. Do what? I had an idea I wanted to share for the Easter eggs, if that's okay. Sure. Um, so I was just, I just was thinking about this as you were showing us. So um, I know sometimes I want my students to go to material that I really couldn't fit into the regular course. I do a lot of extra credit in my classes. Um, so one kind of fun way that maybe you could use these Easter eggs is linking, linking them to like um, uh, pieces of extra material uh, or creating some kind of like puzzle, either visual or a word puzzle or something, or maybe some kind of like, um, uh, you know, each Easter egg would lead them to a different word. They have to collect all the pieces and then yep. put them together um, to get to some extra credit concept or to a link to a, an extra video or something like that. Um, and so you could create uh, create a puzzle out of the Easter egg so that they have an incentive to, mm -hmm. to find all of them. And then when they get them, there's still this extra game layer of like find, putting the puzzle together. Maybe you could have them submit the puzzle as a quiz question yeah. and if they get it right. They open up a level right in, in your course. They access a new level. I feel like what I've noticed that I really like about what you're doing here is just the language itself is exciting, right? I hear Easter egg and I'm like, oh yeah, this is great. I hear like level up and scavenger hunt and I'm immediately more kind of like sucked into what you're doing here. Right. Um, and so I feel like, uh, I feel like any, any way you can kind of like add layers of access, like what we see in normal video games, right? Like people collect different yeah year and they level up and any way you could like build that into your course right they complete a picture by collecting pieces of the picture and putting it together or collaborating with their classmates to assemble uh like a, a large puzzle or something that's you know reveals a message like those could um add a lot of fun to a class and you could make an extra credit and that would also had you to add extra material that you didn't have time for right, right in the main in the main course <laughs> Right, it makes me feel less guilty when I add that extra stuff that it's something they're doing for extra credit and they got to play a game to get there. I don't feel quite as much like I've created so much content to cover because they really are making the choice as to the level that they're engaging with that extra content um, and how they're getting there and how they're doing that. And absolutely um, creating those levels that, that they find different things and it leads to something else down the road is really the whole concept with how that gamification works and how we get there is them making those choices and leading to that next level and creating you know you can have it so that on this one when it when it opens up it gives them this resource or this one when it opens up it gives them this resource um in um art classes for example um having pieces of art throughout the course that may not specifically be the ones that you cover, but are ones or music or any of those things, but, um, or theater or whatever. Um, but you put those in there and when they find them or when they mouse over that, um, that image or that, that piece of information and it takes them to a new place that it wasn't necessarily required. You weren't necessarily going to go over, um, you know, Picasso in this class, but it happens to fit in this thing that you're learning. So you put an extra image in your class of a piece of Picasso art that when they click on it, it actually takes them to a whole nother piece of information. And that can be a hidden content model module within your class. It can be something outside of your class on the internet. Um, it can kind of be anywhere you want it to be and however you want it to go, but it really does, it keeps feeding that information and that willingness to go. And I love the idea of creating puzzles or whatever for them to get to, um, to the next level of learning information. Um, the one thing that I did, um, I wanted to make sure that you all saw how I set up the release conditions uh, and how I made that work. So one of the big things to note with release conditions, and I'll show you really quick how to do a release condition. Um, but one of the big things to note is, is that all conditions must be met or down here, you will see that it is any condition must be met because for this one, they either had to do the Oregon Trail article 
or they had to do the four reasons to promote mass success through games article, depending on which way they went. They're not required to do them both for this activity to open. So it's important to remember that distinction between all and any. Uh, and to add a release condition, uh, when you click where the date was, you click and the release condition option shows up. You can browse if you have some that you've created in your class before, but typically you're going to click the create button. You select the condition you want them to complete. So is it that they have to submit something to the Dropbox? Do they have to get an award? Uh, do they have to complete a checklist? Like all of these options, it could be almost anything. But you pick the thing that you want them to have done. So in this one, let's say we want them to visit a content topic which is actually what this one was. Um, so visit a content topic. You then select the very specific topic that you wanted them to have visited before this activity opens. So for this one, uh, let's say that we wanted them to visit uh, the MIT open source courseware. Um, I mean, they're, it's not in the same module, but you could totally put that in there. And then you hit create. And do you see that it actually added that one as a second requirement in order for our release condition to work? Um, is that not only do they have to have visited the number munchers game, they also had to have gone to the MIT courseware site, um, which has some really cool resources if anybody's ever looking for fun stuff. Um, so, um, so that is how that happens. The one little piece of advice, if I can give you any with release conditions, don't be like Kim. Uh, always make sure you hit update. Because oh. <laughs> you wouldn't believe the number of times that I've gone in and put in release conditions and then I forget to hit update and then pointless. So hit update and then it will actually show this is what it looks like from your perspective. Uh, it will show that all conditions have to be met. These are the conditions that you've listed. That is what it looks like. Now, if you remember on the students ones, they couldn't see the conditions. They just saw that things didn't open until they had done something. Um, now I'm gonna remember to take this out so it doesn't mess us up later. Um, so to remove a release condition, you simply hit that little X, it goes away and hit update again. Um, so it's really easy to take conditions back out. Um, and then the one other thing I wanted to show you, because this is like my Kim's Easter egg gift to you. Um, I mentioned that in here you can embed, and we're in that same dialog box, um, that you can create links underneath images. So the way that you do this one um, is that you would um, insert an image. So we click on the little camera one. We go to our computer or whatever, and we find an image that hopefully we have something fun we can put in there. Um, so we're gonna put in this little heart, um, and it is a heart. Don't forget your alt text. Accessibility. Um, so we're gonna put that in there. So now, well, that's massive. Um, so now we have this little heart, it's in there. Now, before you save, go ahead and highlight over it again, and then click on the insert quick link button. And when you insert that quick link, that's when you can link it to anything in the class or any other resource that you wanna put in there or anything on the internet. Um, so you can literally link it to anything in the world that you want it to link to at that point. So um we're gonna link it i don't know we're just gonna keep linking to the library because i like the library they're very helpful um and we're gonna go ahead and embed that as the location that when you go over this as a student it will actually link you to the library uh so that is how you embed a web link underneath an image so if you're wanting to you know use that picture of picasso but have it linked to picasso's museum um or you have um, you want them to look at a, an opera uh, and you want to link them to the Met because they're doing a, a virtual, free virtual presentation of that. You can have a still image of that, of what that opera is, of like that playbill, and then you can actually embed the link underneath it that would take them to the Met. Um, so that is how you embed those links like that. 
Um, Kim, I, I don't want to be dense, but it looked it looked as though the link on your on the 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 bot picture was only active in the very center, underneath the the, the middle of it. Is that correct? Uh, it's no, it's anywhere as long as the finger is on the picture. Okay, okay. That, so that, as long okay. as, as, long as yeah. your cursor's on the picture, it'll take you there. Got you. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, and same with this one. As long as as soon as it um, as soon as it messages over, and with the student, when you see it from a student's perspective, he can actually kind of play with it and see um, exactly where it happens. But as they're moving around, it will turn to the the finger. That sounds horrible if you didn't know what I was talking about. Um, go, uh, oh, I have a question. Um, have any of y'all actually sure. implemented Easter eggs in a course and did the students like it? I, I have, but is there anybody else? Uh, my students love it, um, but I don't, I don't know how everybody else feels about it. Or has anybody else ever had an example where they used Easter eggs? I've, I've done them in a few classes that I've, I have developed and taught. And then also with a few faculty members um, since I got to MTSU and actually before getting to MTSU as a developer um, and instructional designer. And they, they have all said that they really enjoyed it and the students give them really positive feedback about it. Um, but I don't know that any of those people are actually in our presentation today. <laughs> um, but yeah, they've said that the students really enjoyed it but that it's really important to tell them that they're there so they know to look for them. Um, and always add that statement somewhere before the first one or at the very beginning of the course, or even if it's like in your welcome video announcement that you do like welcoming people to the class that you can just be like, hey, and by the way, there's virtual Easter eggs in the class. And then they will actually go try to find them um, and start engaging with your resources. So my students have said they really like them, but I, I don't, I don't know how much help that is. <laughs> well, and to, to piggyback on that, I have worked with some faculty where we created a specific announcement that had like a little man holding a trophy to let them know there were hidden Easter eggs throughout the course. They were actually attached to things that were required in the course. So we hid the awards with them so that students didn't know by doing something that they were actually supposed to be doing, they would earn these awards. And it was about who's gonna you know, earn the most awards in the class, that kind of thing. So we made an announcement that looked like that, that populated within the first week of the class mm -hmm. um, so that students would know that it existed. And you can give like, give rewards to the people in the class, like whoever gets the most points or whoever finds the most Easter eggs, they get something special. Um, and sometimes it's just that you keep a tally of points and you see them competing with each other because we're competitive by nature. And they start comp competing with each other, wanting to get more points so that they can win, even if the thing they win is literally just a digital badge um, or a, hey, great job, you came in first. But they actually start going through their course and really searching for more things that they could get more points and win um, the game of whatever this the resource is and so they end up actually engaging with more stuff in the class than they might have otherwise so it's kind of cool um what other questions does anybody have at this point how do you make those badges kim please oh that's right I'm so glad you said that because i got a little note down here that says badges um and i should have like looked at that so to get to badges you go to assessments and then you go to awards. And this is the page that pops up. It's the class list awards page. So, so again, because this is in our online certification, there's a whole lot of badging that goes on in this one. It's kind of how we track completion of things. Um, and look, there's an Easter egg. Some people have found the Easter egg. Uh, in this class, because it's, it's me, I have access to a few more um, rewards than than y'all probably do in yours, but a lot of awards um, within D2L are available to everyone. So the way to add a new award to your course is simply click on add award to course from the course awards page. So when you first come onto this page, it, it typically lands on class list awards. And then you're just gonna click the next tab over for course awards. 
and then add award to course. And this is where this pops up. So you've got a couple of options here. You can look through all the badges that are available or you can click on create and create your own. So if there is a specific image that you want to use, um, if there's something that is very particular to you, um, you can create a new one. Um, there's also some self-populated images that are in um, D2L that you can use. Um, I encourage you to start with ones that are um, already in D2L or, um, or ones that you can borrow from somebody else the first time you do it, just because it's, it's fewer steps. Um, but so you're gonna add an award to your course. And so it takes us to this page and these are the ones that are available. Uh, a lot of these are available like across the board. Um, if they've got a little check mark on them, it means that we actually have put them into this class. Um, so this course has these awards in it. So these are some of the ones that already exist out there. I mean, if somebody did a great job, you can give them a good job cookie. Who doesn't want a cookie? Um, so uh, there's all kinds of different options, different ones that are in here. But when you go into any of your classes, if you want to put an Easter egg in your class, if you go, this one maybe, but the ones at the bottom, way down at the bottom, because they're way at the bottom, because they're alphabetical and V is at the bottom. There are two that are created out there in the MTSU D2L instance that are um, available for you. You can just go in and they look just like this in your class. Uh, and if you want to add one of these to your class, you decide which one you want. Uh, do you want this one that's got the little computer stuff on the inside or do you want this one that's more of a, a colorful virtual um, image that way? You click add and that is literally now in your class. It's in your class now. Um, you're going to want to go back to it though and edit your properties so that you know what it is that you're doing with it. So when you go in to edit your properties, award hidden until earned. That's how I do it. And then you create your release condition. So in order for this one to open, we went, we're going to use the content and we're going to use the bop it. Um, and there's way too much stuff in this class. Can, can I ask a, a question on, you just said, like, um, what about like a sort of avatar image? I've seen like, is that complicated to do? No, y'all can, you can upload and create anything you want. As long as it can be uploaded, you can do it. Um, and it can be any kind of an image. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Uh, so that is how you create that Easter egg. That Easter egg is, is now officially in this course. If you click on that Bop It image from um, our gamification presentation, then you will now actually get the badge. So if we click on that, it takes us to the Bop It Wikipedia page. It will now actually, it takes it a little bit. It's not instant. It takes it a little bit, but it will now actually show up up here in my chat notifications um, where this little box is, it actually tells you that you've received a badge and it shows you what it is. And then you can actually take screenshots and digital downloads and all kinds of fun stuff. So, um, so I know that was a lot to cover in a very short period of time, but what kind of questions does anybody have? And I think it's actually 1230. So if people got to go, I get that. Um, but we'll be here for a second if y'all have additional questions that you want to ask. And thank y'all very much. How did the students see the awards? Um, like when you went to assessments awards and it said class list, can all the students see who has what awards or can they only see their own? I'm worried about FERPA. If you have it linked to any sort of grade in the class. So let me show you what it looks like as a student. I think that's probably the best way to show you. Um, so as a student, when I go to awards, this is what it shows me. So the only options are the awards that I've gotten in the class. And then it also shows me the ones that are available to me. Okay. So, and so if you're the teacher that mm -hmm. you're the only one that sees the class list with who has what. 
Correct. Okay, you're the, got it. You're the Thank only you. one that sees it. Uh, and this is what a student's perspective would be is they can see all the ones they still haven't earned and they can see the ones they have earned, but they have no idea how everybody else is doing unless you actually do it as a competition that you're like, this person has this many, but you don't have to ever tell them what those are for. Okay. All right. Thank you. Oh, you're it, welcome. Is there an immediate pop-up that shows them the award? Like when they, when they click on the BOP, it, does the graphic of the award pop up or do they literally have to go under my awards and search for it? So um, it, it sometimes takes it just a little bit in D2L for it to cycle through and process it. It's not always instantaneous. Um, but up where it has the subscription alerts up at the top, they will okay. get one of those little orange dots that says that you have an alert. Um, and then um, this that is what they look like. Um, I guess, can y'all see those? Okay. That is what those look like. So a few hours ago when I was testing it, um, that uh, this is the one that I got. Um, so it gave me a virtual Easter egg. Um, and then this is the one and the, hopefully this one will actually, so this is what this one looks like. So if you want to really see the detail, then they need to be on the awards badge page and it will actually pop up and look like that. Okay. Uh, so this is where the information is. It's when they earned it. It's how they earned it. It's why they earned it. Um, and then they can print if they really want to keep it, um, but, they can print but, it or. But the graphic doesn't pop up unless they click the link. It's not like an right. automatic da da da. You no, know? <laughs> but this, this does. Um, this will automatically notify them that they did something because yeah. they'll get a little orange dot up there. So as long as they pay attention to their notifications, they'll know that in itself might be. I was to say, that's a big if. <laughs> right. <laughs> If, if we haven't used uh, gamification before and want to start, what would you suggest as a good starting place just to, what would you do first? Uh, for me, what I would do first, honestly, is start with an Easter egg because they're quick and easy. Mm -hmm. um, and they don't necessarily involve full uh, development of your content. So if you're going full on gamification in a class, um, you kind of got to think about it in terms of every step of your content and how different things interact and play with each other. Um, but it's also possible that within, within your content, if there's something that you really want to make sure that they read this one thing before they do this other thing, because it has something in it that is crucial, um, then you can do those release conditions and attach it the same way. Um, the one thing about that, be careful with release conditions. Um, if you wouldn't require the same thing in your face-to-face -face class, you got to be kind of aware of how you're doing that in your online class. So, and by that, I mean, in order for a, a module to open, you don't want to attach that they have to have watched seven videos, clicked on nine links and done a quiz and three discussion posts because your face-to-face -face students aren't required to do that. So what's happening when we do stuff like that is that we're creating a level of expectation and accountability in our students that this, that's not the same across the board. Um, as much as we want everyone to want to do every single thing in a class, um, if we put release conditions that make it impossible for them to go to the next module in the class or to take an exam without doing all of these things, we're making a choice for them on their learning instead of them making that choice. Mm -hmm. um, so as much as we don't want to, we actually, if someone makes the choice to not be successful, we kind of have to let them not be successful. Like we don't want to cause them to not be successful, but if somebody makes the choice not to do a discussion because they really just don't want the points and it's not important to them, we can't prevent them from doing the next thing in the class that has to do with an activity or assessment. So whenever you do things with gamification, you've got to be really clear about what those clear expectations are in order for the next thing to happen. So you have to choose this or this, you have to do this or this. Not that they have to, like for the Oregon Trail and the number of munchers, instead of doing both, you need to do one or the other. It gives you this choice and then you do this. If they want to go back and do it, they can, but it, 
we can't do the has to meet all in order for a graded assessment to open. Hey, it just showed up. Did you see the little orange dot in the top? Mm -hmm. That means that I got the award. So that's what that means. So does that answer? I'm wondering your if there. Sorry. No, did that answer your question? It no? did. It, it did. Thank you. I'm wondering if there might be a way. I mean, this is really simple, but I'm wondering if it there might be a way to use this to encourage them to really look at the syllabus. You know, we're halfway through the semester and I'm yeah. still receiving questions about what do we do with this project? And, you know, they had a page and a half the first day that explained what to do with the project, you know, yeah. and I gave them points. But of course, to get the points, all they got to do is submit, yes, I got the syllabus, you know. So I wonder if this would make it more fun for them if there's some way to yeah, you know, yeah. give, give them a badge for looking at the syllabus. But I guess yeah. they still could pretend like they looked at the syllabus. I just, it, it causes them so much stress because they don't think they have the information to complete the project, but really they do have it and they had it the first day, yeah. you know. Uh -huh. um, I have actually done scavenger hunts on the syllabus mm -hmm. the first week as an assignment. And um, when we first were out for COVID and started using um, online books, I had some classes that I hadn't required a book. And when we had free downloads available, I required everybody to do the download so that we could have um, something in, that, that they would have page numbers and things that they might not have needed in an on-ground class. And I did a scavenger hunt with that. And it was mainly uh, not really about content, but about how to learn to use the book. You know, they had to, they had to find something in the index and they had to find uh, something that was, uh, um, I can't remember what all the resources in that particular book were, but it was all about accessing the resources. And that was like the first project and the same thing with the syllabus. That was the first project. And, um, and they had to complete a certain, I think it was 80% or 75% or whatever was a release condition before they could move on to the next thing. Um, I don't know whether they liked it or not, but it certainly cut down on questions, you know, later. So. <laughs> That's helpful. Uh, yeah. Kim, did, did you have a question, Ken? I'm going to stop share, by the way. So did you have a question, Ken? Your hand is I do. And actually, um, yeah, I'm glad that you stopped that. But because now I have you. Um, <laughs> discussions. So students, you can't give anybody special access or additional access on discussions. Or I can't figure out how to do that. You can do a release condition that's just for selected students. Mm -hmm. It's there. actually geared toward accessibility, but you can, you could gear it to other things as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, you can choose them by name. You can have a drop down menu of your class and choose by name, which oh, one. Well, it's different than releasing for a quiz or for Dropbox. I could, you know, I have students that are there every, this Snowmageddon, uh, I've got students that are literally, I don't know if they're going to come back. And I, you know, and I want to, I want to help as much as I can, but I can't, you know, I didn't know how to open up a discussion. So it's like, I'm sorry, that'll be your drop grade. Yeah, you can reopen it for individual people. You um, can. Yeah, you can. You can reopen it for individual people. Do what? I, I couldn't figure out how to do it. I, yeah. I, I'll, now I know you can. I mean, I Googled it and apparently in some schools, you don't have that option. And um that's cool that we do. Yeah, we do. Okay. I mean, I'll, I can figure it out. If I know it's a possibility, I, I mean, I'll, I'll, I, I'm diligent. <laughs> <laughs> I learned a lot. I got here a little bit late, um, but um, this, I think this, I see a lot of possibilities for this. It's fun, right? <laughs> I, I have Very a question fun. about the, um, the games, the, I get all the Easter eggs and release conditions and all that, mm -hmm. but um, okay, for Oregon Trail, I understand how that would work beautifully in a writing class or a history class or whatever, 
But if it's something that's absolutely unrelated and there's just no way to relate it, you know, I teach theatrical makeup and it is a very narrow, specific thing, you know, or if you were teaching chemistry, that's a very narrow, specific thing. Inserting a game just feels like useless extra work. You know, I don't get how you tie that in in any way. But, but I also want to make sure I'm not missing something. So I tried to show y'all a lot of different types of gamification examples that sometimes it literally is actually games. Um, but sometimes the, it's, it's more of the concept of gamification is the um, seeking and finding and going on a path. That so it doesn't actually have to be a game <laughs> okay. um, as much as it could be. Um, so theatrical makeup um okay I've never actually done theater so I'm just going to take a stab on this one but um you know if it was a class that talked about uh, I don't know best practices and how to apply it right. um are there videos and resources out there that you would want them to view um and maybe even view kind of in a particular order Yes, um, and I use that now. You know, I do use lots of videos that are external sources and there are links inserted and all of that. Um, and, and I like the Easter egg idea and I think I can work with some of that. But I, I just, okay, if I were a 35 year old with kids and somebody wanted me to watch Oregon Trail before I moved the next thing, I'd say, hell no. You know, well, that, that, doesn't, that, seem, do that doesn't seem fun to me. It, it would be if you were in a, um, and I didn't put all of the details that would go along with that activity in there. So that activity actually works really fantastic um, in a history class or yes, a class yes. or a social justice class. Yeah, um, like so part of it is is knowing what it is that that you're teaching and what uh, what your topic is. So, okay. um, you know, there is actually uh, there's games out there that are like fashion plates or yeah. like makeup kind of thing. Yeah, I mean, like yeah. there's all kinds of stuff out there. So you okay. could actually have something like that. Um, if you actually wanted a game, but really with gamification, yeah, I wanted to put some games in there mostly because I think they're fun and people like to play yeah. games. But uh, the game, actual playing of games is only a very small portion of the concept of gamification. Okay. Um, it really does embed itself into the concept of um, creating opportunities to be rewarded, right. um, creating opportunities to make connections to content in the way that that helps you process your learning and kind of move forward with what that is. Think about it in terms of like um, a, a Girl Scout Gold Award or a, I don't know what it is for Boy Scouts. Um, yeah. but Eagle Scout. <laughs> well, like Eagle Scout, but I don't actually know how they get there. Um, the Girl Scout Gold Award, I know how they get there because I have one of those. But, you know, that you go through and you do all of those badges and it gets you to the next level. And then yeah. you do a badge and it gets you to the next level. And then you do a badge. And so you eventually work your way up to the highest possible level of achievement. Gamification concepts within learning are the same thing. You're not always getting a badge, but when you are accomplishing something or when you're finding something or you're researching something, it's getting you down that next path. Right. And um, so you are not in any way suggesting that we insert stuff that's not related. We have to find related material right and that's right. the the crux of it right and use it right the way to analyze something okay yes yes, yes. i have another theoretical question okay <laughs> okay Sorry. i don't want to waste anybody's time um i am in a learning community that the crux of it is reteaching students to focus on intrinsic learning and minimizing external awards, including grades. So sure. that's sort of diametrically opposed to giving somebody an award. Um, how does that, you know what I mean? How does that reconcile the idea that they should learn because learning in itself is fun? Well, isn't it, isn't it though? Like, yes, being, it is. I, I mean, it for is. me, it is. Um, but I think, I, it is. I think but, that actually is the the basic concept 
um, and thinking about it in terms of the reward doesn't need to necessarily be a badge. The reward really can actually be, I accomplished this thing right. or I found this thing or okay. I did this process or this step um, or any yeah. number of, could, um, and it can be that. And then there, so there's a whole nother piece of gamification that that is a, a whole nother thing um, that you actually set your course up that um, instead of it being, um, you start with this many points um, and you lose points as you go. So, you know, like, yeah. When you turn in a project, you start with 100 points. And then as you do things wrong, we take points off. Yes. So instead, it's the you start with the other of that. Um, and within the class, say you need to have 500 points to get an A. But you have 850 points available. OK, got so it. How you get there is much more into your choice and your path and your way of getting to that space um so it it's still tied to a grade and that we still need to turn in grades but it's your choice and how yeah. your learning uh continued and how you got to that now within that concept i usually have if i do that in a class i actually have a couple of things that you have every world except these two things yeah. you have to do these two things I'm going to be a meanie and I'm going to make you do these two things. But then with without that, you get all these other things that you get to pick from and do. OK, um, so that's that makes how I address sense. that. Yes, <laughs> I get it. I think I was hung up on the badges. <laughs> yeah, well, and you don't even have to do badges. I mean, right. you Can, I have another. Sorry, I don't mean to be dominant. Never mind. Let's <laughs> Does anybody else have a question before we go? I just wanted to say thank you so much. This was really yeah. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you. I'm glad you can make it. I know we went over. I'm so sorry. I do that a lot. Like you know, you're dealing with students being depressed and like just trying to inject more energy into the classroom is you know takes yeah. a lot of creative thought. So it does. I think a lot of the ideas that you introduced and think about them a little bit because I also I'm not I don't play games. I grew up like other people played games, but I don't other than chess. So I have to think about how I can build this in, but that's something they do. So I wonder yeah. if we could build chess into your class. <laughs> yeah. Oh, well, yeah, um, I am catching on now. With. <laughs> I mean, that might be fun. Maybe we could figure that out. It seems pretty involved, but maybe, maybe <laughs> we can figure it out. <laughs> Thank you so much. Oh, you're so very welcome. Okay, now I do have another question. Um, I saw that there was a badge for well written and creative rock star. So that sounds like response to a work. Um, can you award something after you've graded it like you've gone through D2L and you see something that's particularly creative. So how do you attach a badge to that and not tie it to a predetermined thing. Oh, and not have it as a predetermined. You can actually um, award the, in the same way. You can go in and individually award badges um, based on something. So um, I wonder if I have one in here. That let me let me talk amongst yourself for a minute while I look for <laughs> one so that I can. Like if I graded Jane Do Doe's project and it was particularly well written. And John's was particularly creative, but had 14,000 spelling errors. You know, how can I give one one badge and one the other? Um, who are we looking for? That's not in this class. <laughs> of course, it's not in this class. That's okay. I can look. Oh my God, let me show you. It's not in this class. Okay. Um, it's in one of my other ones. So, um, but it actually has to do with how the, the properties are in there um, and how you assign it. But you can also, um, let me, I'm, I'm going to share it. Let's see it. So also, so when you are in, oops, when you are in the class awards 
I can click on Karen and I can click issue and then a box pops up that says um, select an award and I would literally go through all of the awards that are available in the class and pick the one that I wanted to give her. Um, so say I want to give Karen, hey, thanks for letting me use you, Karen, I really appreciate it. Say I wanted to go ahead and give her the virtual Easter egg. I literally would click on that one and then I would say, um, you clicked it. Um, there, it would be much more involved than that probably. But, um, and then I, I hit issue and look at that. Karen just got Yay, an award. Badges. <laughs> um, right, so winning, winning. You didn't have to do anything. You just had to be there um, and you got an award. So it is super easy to do it for an individual. I was trying to show you one that I had, but I, it okay. wasn't in there. But, um, but that is it from the class list. You, you click on the individual student and then you click issue and then you select the badge you want to give. Okay. Um, the badge has to be in your class first or you okay. can't issue it. Um, but if you decide you want to do one, it's not in there. You just go create the badge <laughs> and yeah. then, and then you go and issue it. So, um, it, it's not like it has to be in there six months ahead of time. It, it needs to be in there before you issue it. So, so if I've never used badges and I want to give Cecil a badge, then I open up badges, create that one and then choose them. Yep. And they don't have to have won one previously to be on the list. Nope. It's no, a complete are in the class. class. Yeah, everybody, everybody that's enrolled um, shows up on that list. Okay, cool. Um, whether they've ever gotten one or not. Yay. All right. Great class. Thanks. I'm glad you could join us today. Me too. I'm glad you made it. I'm glad we found your link. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I think I'm going to do badges and I can't find the link. That's, uh, <laughs> that's, aspirational <laughs> i'm afraid <laughs> we'll see well you All know right. we're here if you ever have questions yeah